Welcome back to the weekend wrap. No production, just my thoughts. Back around of normal time, it usually happens, you know, but um, yeah, didn't have anywhere specific to be. I mean, I still got to go to the gym a little later on. Agreed to take my mum food shopping. So I will be doing that probably after this uh, finishes. Uh, go get her and do that. But yeah, um, we had a very busy weekend. So much so I'm not really sure what I'm going to be able to cover this week on uh, the breakdown because there's kind of a lot to go through. It might be a, an extended episode or we might just have to say no, we can only talk about two or three. But that being said, uh, let's talk about what I put on basis picks, what I got right and what I got wrong. And then we'll go through the cards as a whole. So um, I predicted that Lauren Price would get a UD over Naomi Manns. That came to pass. I predicted that um, Dan Aziz would actually um, stop uh, Thomas Foray in the 11th round. I said it was either going to be 11th round stoppage or it will go unanimous decision on points. I said, I don't think he'd get him out of there in the 12th if it goes to the 12th, but in the 11th, he's got him. Well, in the 11th, he almost had him. And lo and behold, in the 12th, he got him <laughs> about 40 seconds into the round. So, I mean, yeah, I got the stoppage. I guess I got the right part of the fight overall. I was a bit, I was, what, 40 seconds out. I'll still take it. Um, obviously, I didn't put a bet on, on the round, but I did put a bet on the, uh, the stoppage itself. Now, I also predicted that Diego Pacheco would take out... Um, Jack Cullen, uh, I said, I think I said in the fifth round. So he ended up getting him out in the fourth. So again, not too close, uh, not too far away, I should say. Uh, let's talk about what I got wrong. And I think everyone got this one wrong. Uh, Carlos Sackham wins a points decision over Tony Yoko. Now, in my preview, I believe I did say something along the lines of Yoko's best bet in this fight is to keep it long to fight taller than he normally does and keep Carlos Takam behind his jab. Now, I guess what I forgot in this scenario is while Carlos Takam, yes, is like slower and like, you know, he's got to basically lunge in to get into range. He's actually got, I think, a wingspan almost the same as Tony Yoka's, which means whenever Yoka's going to get a shot off, Takam can actually reach him at the same point. He's got very long arms. Um, but, I thought that, you know, Yoko would get, he would get hassled, he would get hurried, but he would have enough to be able to just keep Carlos Takam behind the jab, grind out a points victory. He wasn't going to look good. He wasn't going to look spectacular. Um, he was going to have to work hard for it, but he was going to get a points victory. Well, one of the judges agreed with me, inexplicably, but the other two gave it to Carlos Takam and a lot closer than it should have been. Um, I think I gave Yoko two rounds in that fight maybe uh, but I said on Twitter just before um, the scorecards I read that over or under 35% Carlos Takam gets screwed on the scorecards and um, yeah it was a uh, it was almost it was almost a case but um, there was that and lastly I did predict that Tony Harrison would ju would uh, manage to get a decision over in um, over in Australia against Tim Zhu I did have a feeling that, you know, a, a knockout or some type of, um, you know, wearing down stoppage would be possible. Um, I just kind of thought he was in a different type of mindset, especially being in the camp like, with Alicia and some of the other people that are in that gym currently. But it looks like the, you know, the concentration monster, the, you know, the gas tank, everything just kind of, it happened again. Now, Funny enough, there was a couple rounds here where when he wasn't moving and he was actually sitting on the inside, it was a he was actually doing a lot better and I feel was winning those rounds more than when he was just laying on the ropes. But um that being said, big congrats to Tim Zhu. As you guys can tell, I'm not actually doing this in any particular order at this point. Um I will go through just the fights that I saw. Uh so I guess we'll start with we'll start from the top and work our way back. So yeah, first off, massive congratulations to Tim Zhu. Um one thing I also said in the other video is that the difference between these two is within the last um two and a half, three years, Tim Zhu has fought like six or seven times. And in that same period of time Tony Harrison's only fought twice. 
and I felt that also could be an issue. Um, either having to get back, for trying to get back into the groove, keep those, keep that, you know, those tires well oiled, keep the engine, you know, keep the engine ticking over. Like two, two bits of activity in that length of time just isn't enough, especially in your early to mid thirties. Uh, Tim Zhu has been active, and the one thing I said about Tim Zhu from his last fight with Terrell Gache is he's 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 constantly learning. Even when he's making mistakes, like he's correcting those moving forward, like, and he definitely is a proponent of momentum is the best thing you can have as a as an athlete as a boxer. Because right now he's got great momentum going behind him. He worked very very controlled in that in the fight. He decided not to try and jab with Tony Harrison because he realized that's not a battle he was ever going to win. But he just stayed close enough to him, applying gradual pressure gradual pressure every time tony would move he would sort of follow him and he would instead of just trying to jab he would just throw power punches whether upstairs or downstairs uh and tony from tony wasn't able to sort of really set about the jab too tough um you know the rest of it kind of just offset and i did say in the in the preview stylistically tim zoo has got the style that beats Tony Harrison. Pure boxers, they like to control distance, they like to control tempo, and they like to work on the outside at their own pace, but Tim Zhu is a textbook pressure fighter. He's not uh, the type of pressure fighter that just wings in shots like left, right, and center. It doesn't give you a moment to, to reset, but he's just always in your face. He's always on top of you. Like He just doesn't give you much of a, much of a moment to breathe. And yeah, um, it just caught up to Tony, unfortunately. Now, Steve Farhood had the fight scored 79 73 to um to tim zoo only gave tony harrison the first round which i thought was ridiculous even obviously harrison at this point is like you can you've got to think that that's the person that they're really invested in because harrison charlo three is a you know there's a good narrative behind that and tim zoo obviously is this australian guy that yeah they've got him uh they you know they've got him on a, a deal at the moment but he can quite easily at any point in time for lack of a better phrase piss off <laughs> and you know they now have no belts whereas you know if you got tony then you kind of keep it in house i you know i would thought that he would have been looking at it a bit more leniently on his side but i had it scored at the time of stoppage um 77 75 to uh tim zoo i had it five rounds to three um i gave tony the first round and i gave him the seventh and the eighth i thought he was starting to get comfortable in there um but when I say this, I even said he's winning these rounds. He's like, he's getting back into it, but I can just see this being a recipe for disaster. Like maybe he, he'll get too comfortable and either switch off or he'll be in the middle of something and then get caught. And that's, and that will sort of just affect the fight. I, I put something very similar like that on Twitter. Um, not in that greater detail, you know, 150 characters, but yeah, um, pretty much that's kind of what I, I had said. Um, but yeah, look, as I said, uh, big congrats to, to Tim Zhu. He goes into that Charlo fight now, but provided Charlo doesn't move up and vacate those titles, Tim doesn't win that fight because Charlo has the stylistic advantage over Tim. And definitely he's got the power to make Tim not think he can just walk him down and stay on his chest the whole, the whole fight. That's what Costano tried in the first fight and it works off of emotion. But second fight, when the emotion was a bit more curtailed and checked, we saw what happened. And the same thing will probably happen to Tim Zhu. Probably worse because he squares up a lot. But that's analysis for another time. Um, he deserves his flowers for this one. It was a great performance. I don't know why he's so enamored with um, Ja Rule and, you know, but hey, <laughs> um, we'll leave that. We'll leave that one there. All right. So from there, we had... Uh, Tony Yoko and Carlos Takam again as I said like Tony Yoko I, I put a tweet out saying that you know Martin Bacoli took his soul and has basically got it locked in a vault uh, it, it's not going anywhere because he he fought this fight like he had no heart like he had no conviction like he wasn't you know the better fighter in there against a guy that's 41 42 years old you know on the back of i think three losses in his last four or or, or something along those lines you know takam at this point is pretty much a gatekeeper um and i think he'll happily tell you that like i don't think he's ever he's looking for one last run to the title he's just like looking for the good paydays and checking out the, the prospects and yeah yoko's not it um he definitely needs to get rid of virgil hunter that's 
that's for damn sure. Um, I said that previously. I know Lennox probably, if you're watching this, Lennox has said that there's several others. Like Virgil was just not the right guy for him. But outside of that, now I don't even know if he's necessarily got the the heart to you know to carry on and to be a gatekeeper because what he'll be now is a gatekeeper unless he can really change it around and I don't know if he can so it might be an early retirement for him and you know that Olympic gold medal just being like you know the highlight of his of his career I mean look it was the same for um, Luke Campbell right and uh, you know there's nothing wrong with just being an Olympic gold medalist just being a great amateur um, some the pros may not be for everyone but hey uh yeah I'll, I'll be interested to see what happens with Takam kind of moving forward but that'll be it'll be interesting um Martin Bacoli was in the studios um saying that he stopped both Dubois and Usyk twice in sparring each and whether that's true or not don't know um but you know he does say some things that then when you hear back it's like well actually we found that it's not true maybe that is the truth but it's like that's probably not the way for you to get fights at this point in time you know you're not a high ticket at the minute anyway and now you've apparently stopped like the unified heavyweight champ twice since Warren and one of his challengers I mean who's really going to face you now unless they have to pay over the odds so you know it wasn't the smartest decision to do but hey um if it, if it happened, okay, cool. Um, let's see it happen in, in the ring, you know, as opposed to sparring, because, you know, sparring is sparring. Um, Diego Pacheco um, made pretty quick work of Jack Cullen. As again, as I said he would, um, I like that guy. He's a prospect going, well, okay, there's not really a prospect anymore, but he's, I won't, I can't put him in contender status. He's like fringe at this point. He needs, he needs a gatekeeper type fight. Um, but I know that he wants the Edgar Belango fight and I know Edgar's got the free fight deal signed with Matchroom. I wouldn't be surprised if either Edgar's third fight is supposed to be Canelo, but they're like, well, we have to do this one because Canelo's busy, but you get Canelo next after you fight Diego Pacheco. Either way, Belango Pacheco is going to happen either on his second or the third fight of his deal. And I imagine Diego Pacheco, like, beats the brakes of Edgar Belanga. He's just, the way he's improving at such a rapid rate is frightening. Um, he's in the right camp and Belanga wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't do well against David Benavidez. He wouldn't do well against David Morel Jr. And Diego Pacheco is a level below both of those at this point in time. But again, he just turned 22 on the weekend. So um, that's definitely good work for him moving forward. But he needs to get to that next level before we can then start talking about like title contention. But in the, the day, 18 and 0 now. What is it, 18 and 0? No, 19 and 0. Sorry, 16 KOs. But he's still 22. There's absolutely no rush to world titles or anything. He can take another couple of years if they really want to. If they want to solidify him and make sure that he's bona fide, just to wait his turn. Or you can let him off the leash now. If he fails, you can build him back up. He's got plenty of years left in the sport he's a and he's just a great model professional for the youngsters just like Devin Haney uh, Shakur Stevenson you know sort of in that mold so big up to him uh, Lauren Price uh, she did what she needed to do it, um, it was a very uh, workmanlike performance there was nothing sort of special about it but it was just you know a competent performance uh, fairly dominant um, only managed to get out twice last year so I understand it you know sometimes you don't always just get that fire sparking straight away but it is what it is no no issues with that um Rhiannon Dixon I look I'll give her her props I know uh, Julius from Ring IQ he gave his prediction her. I predicted her to to win a points decision and she ended up getting a stoppage in the sixth round congratulations her first stoppage seven seven and oh with one KO now um yeah big ups to her I didn't put any predictions on um What's the name? Dar uh, is it Daryl Foley or Daryl Foley and um, Robbie Davis Jr. But the you know the ankle injury, snapping the ankle as he did um, was yeah it wasn't nice to see. One thing that I can't stand is leg injuries. Like that's the only thing that can really sort of make me wince. Uh, ankle snaps, knee sn like leg snaps. Uh, those that's it. Like arms, I'm fine with everything else. Yeah, and any film, anytime I see that, that's the only thing that I can't physically like, I can't just watch it and be calm like I, I visibly react badly when I see those things so I felt bad for him that obviously that happened um, 
no idea if he would have actually won the fight because remember he did get knocked down the round before and he got knocked down in that round even though he was doing quite well in the first um, but yeah unfortunate that may end up being the end of his career he's not the youngest of guys and that was one of those last chance saloons so that probably is him done and if so it's unfortunate that that's the way to go out but at least in the best possible way at least you went out that way without instead of actually getting like knocked out um, you know or losing a fight you know, I guess you could say legitimately, you wasn't beaten by the better man, you just, you lost because of a freak accident. So if you're going to lose, if you're going to lose and end your career, that may be like the best way probably to go out, in my opinion. Last but not least, I want to talk about Super Dan Aziz against Thomas Foray. Dan put on a amazing performance an amazing performance um, this is probably I think his best performance since the Hosea Burton fight and I think what made this performance good is that in a lot of his other fights everyone became kind of negative once they felt he couldn't once they felt they couldn't really affect him or get um, you know really get any real um, respect from him from punching power or the shots that they were throwing he'd slip underneath you know he'll sort of come inside work on the chest but Thomas Foray to his credit was fighting back every round even though he was getting backed up onto the ropes getting his head snapped back his nose was busted from i think the second round but he never gave up and he was always swinging big punches with dan had to stay switched on and dan did stay switched on he barely took anything he i don't think he took a clean shot for the entire fight maybe one or two like sneaky shots but none were like clean power they was just a lot of like maybe oh you, you got you know maybe just a little a little jolt to keep you back on track keep you back on track but he just he ground he ground his man down a couple times foray was complaining to the ref about things um which was a little i think sometimes there was a bit of a language barrier there between the ref and what was going on it's like hey what's what's happening here but ultimately dan's like well hey we're, this is this is where we're at and there was a time uh, Foray tried to touch gloves with him and Dan just just yelled in his face like, nah, <laughs> he's like, I'm going back to the corner. Like we carrying this on next round. And he just like, he just went to town. Um, so I'm proud of my Lewis, my Lewis Shum compatriot, my blue borough Don, like big ups to Dan. Um, as again, I thought you'd get him out in the 11th. And at the time when it was getting to the 11th, I thought, oh, okay, he's gonna, he's hitting perfect, he's hitting perfect. As soon as he hit 11th point, I thought, oh, okay, he's going to go points, but this was a dominant performance. He ain't got to worry about scorecards or split decisions or nothing like that. Like, he just got this in the bag. Lo and behold, um, he's exchanging with Thomas. Thomas, again, big credit because he, he was fighting till the end. But, he, you know, he tried to exchange with Dan, got caught side of the jaw with a you know with a looping with a looping right it was it didn't even like it landed that clean but it just landed where it needed to land and thomas obviously busted up tired just worn down to the point and then it was almost like it just shut him off temporarily the referee to his credit saw that jumped in um and stopped it i know thomas wanted to carry on but at that particular point again if your body shuts down like that in the middle of the ring for you to be able to get given clean shots directly afterwards that's when the referee's supposed to jump in he did the right thing so no complaints on that one um but yeah that was pretty much all i saw i haven't seen any before the bells undercards i saw that there was a couple of good prospects on the um the tony harrison fight i need to watch those i literally only managed to tune in for the main event but i know some people saw the prelims and like the undercard um I think I fell asleep when the when the undercard started, so I literally woke up just before, uh, just as the main event was coming in. So yeah, um, I'm gonna have to go back and watch some of those previous stuff. I'll, I'll get around to it. Uh, it's not urgent at this point, but yeah. Overall, I saw all the main stuff, and I just gotta figure out what I'm gonna talk about on Tuesday. But listen, I got a jet. That's the weekend pretty much wrapped up. Thank you for watching and I will catch you on the next video because there's been some interesting stuff that has happened uh, yesterday and even this morning. Uh, we'll talk about that during the week. But thank you for watching and I'll catch you on the next one. Peace.